Welcome to the lecture on the introductory chapter of David Chalmers's The Conscious Mind, entitled Taking Consciousness Seriously. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture we'll be looking at what has come to be known as the hard problem of consciousness. We'll be distinguishing the hard problem from what Chalmers calls the easy problem of consciousness, as well as seeing what's different between the ways that philosophers of mind think about mind and mental phenomena and the ways that empirical scientists think about the mind and related phenomena. We'll also be looking at a few solutions to, or at least proposed solutions to, the hard problem of consciousness. Consciousness is as perplexing as it ever was. It still seems utterly mysterious that the causation of behavior should be accompanied by a subjective inner life. We have good reason to believe that consciousness arises from physical systems such as brains, but we have little idea how it arises or why it exists at all. How could a physical system such as a brain also be an experiencer? Why should there be something it is like to be such a system? Present-day scientific theories hardly touch the really difficult questions about consciousness. We do not just lack a detailed theory. We are entirely in the dark about how consciousness fits into the natural order. So says David Chalmers in the introduction to his very important philosophical work from 1996, The Conscious Mind. The Conscious Mind is a slightly more detailed version of Chalmers' doctoral thesis that he wrote at Indiana University under Doug Hofstetter. Many of you uh, will know Hofstetter from his amazing book, um, Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Chalmers worked under him. Chalmers is about as close to a philosophical rock star as we have today. And you can see that uh, his, his public persona, his outward appearance, is in line with that picture of him as a rock star. Also teaches you that philosophers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and appearances. He is really quite a sight to behold, David Chalmers. Before we get into Chalmers' specific claims about the hard problem of consciousness, we need to first look at the overarching philosophical sub-discipline known as the philosophy of mind. What is the philosophy of mind? Philosophers of mind are concerned with what minds are, what minds can do, and how minds are able to do precisely what it is that they can do. Some of the questions that are asked by philosophers of mind are, for example, what is the nature of mind? If something is a mind, what does it have to have? What kind of substance is the mind? Is the mind purely physical? Is it partially physical and somewhat non-physical? What is the relation between minds and bodies? Is the mind just a component of the body? Is it something over and above the body? Does it arise out of particular bodily states? What are the different sorts of mental states? Surely we know about emotional states and cognitive states, but how do those relate to each other? Are there further mental states? How does experience fit into all of that? What are the particular contents of mental states. Some people say that mental states and brain states are identical to each other. Some people say that while many of the brain states are in fact mental states, there can be mental states that are outside of the brain or even outside of the body. There's a thesis known as the extended mind hypothesis that one of my advisors works on. Um, he doesn't think much of it, but the Hypothesis says that things that are outside of the brain and even outside of the body can count as mental states. Further, 
What is the relationship between the mind and the world? This is expressed generally in terms of questions about intentionality. How can minds be directed at the world in the appropriate way such that we can refer to the world or we can know things about the world? And finally, what's the nature of consciousness? And it's this final question that we'll be looking at in this lecture. It's important when understanding the nature of the philosophical subdiscipline known as the philosophy of mind to not confuse it with empirical science and further not to think that empirical science answers all of the possible questions that we could have about mind. Philosophers of mind are generally interested in the nature of and possibilities for particular minds or mental states, while empirical scientists who study the brain and related phenomena are generally interested in the physical underpinnings or correlates of mental states. Now, someone might say that all we need to investigate in order to investigate the mind is uh, the physical underpinnings and correlates of mental states, but notice that that claim itself would be a philosophical claim. So we at least need to do some philosophy of mind, even if we'll do most of our investigation of minds via empirical science. Neither the philosopher of mind nor the empirical scientist just makes the mere assumption that the mind is equal to the brain. Surely we all know that minds and brains are related to each other. We know that if something's going on in your mind, we can see things going on in your brain using fMRI uh, studies, for instance. And we know that if we do things to your brain, then stuff happens to your mind. That doesn't prove on its own that the mind and the brain are identical to one another, and we would actually need to do some philosophy of mind in order to come up with arguments for or against the claim that the mind is just identical to the brain. And while there is overlap in the topics that are studied by philosophers of mind and empirical scientists, the particular questions that are asked by philosophers of mind and empirical scientists are distinct from one another. So there's no need to think that a philosopher of mind is downplaying the importance of empirical scientists uh, of empirical science or that an empirical scientist is downplaying the importance of the philosophy of mind both of these ways of investigating the mind can together give us a full picture of what's going on in our brain and mental lives since this lecture is about consciousness It'll be important for us to have some basic understanding of what consciousness is. Now, probably the best understanding you can get of consciousness is via introspection. You're listening to a lecture right now. You're viewing words on a screen. There are things going on around you. You have memories and insights. You have certain sensations and hopes and plans and emotions. All of this is part of what constitutes consciousness, and your most immediate access to a definition of, con of consciousness is your immediate access to your own conscious states. But here's what Chalmers says. Conscious experiences range from vivid color sensations to experiences of the faintest background aromas, from hard-edged pains to the elusive experience of thoughts on the tip of one's tongue, from mundane sounds and smells to the encompassing grandeur of musical experience, from the triviality of a nagging itch to the weight of a deep existential angst, from the specificity of the taste of peppermint to the generality of one's experience of selfhood. We can say that a being is conscious if there is something it is like to be that being. Similarly, a mental state is conscious if there is something it is like to be in that mental state. To put it another way, we can say that a mental state is conscious if it has a qualitative feel, an associated quality of experience. Thus, if there's a subjective what it's like to be something, then that thing is conscious. And if things are able to have states, 
such that there's something it's like to be in that state, then those states are conscious states. So notice already that we're not merely asking about what certain neurons do at certain times. Or we're not merely asking about the causes of certain brain phenomena. We're asking about something that seems to be qualitatively different from that. Now that doesn't mean it's a different substance. That doesn't mean that there's something supernatural or magical going on, but it does mean that when we start our investigation of consciousness, we should start from the phenomenon of consciousness itself. And that's what Chalmers suggests that we do. We need to, as he says, take consciousness seriously by starting from consciousness and seeing where we can go from there. Chalmers breaks down the study of consciousness into what he calls the easy problem and the hard problem. Now we should note that by the easy problem, Chalmers doesn't mean that we don't need very many very uh, smart and ingenious um, people investigating the easy problem and all of the things that follow from the easy problem in order to solve the easy problem. So it's being easy doesn't mean its solution is just automatic or that even untrained people could come up with the solution. And we are still working on the many various uh, components of the easy problem of consciousness. The thought here is merely that we know generally how to solve the easy problem of consciousness and we're probably much more than half of the way to getting a complete solution to the easy problem. Here's how Chalmers describes the easy problem. How does the brain process environmental stimulation? How does it integrate information? How do we produce reports on internal states? These are important questions, but to answer them is not to solve the hard problem. Why is all this processing accompanied by an experienced inner life? That's the hard problem. Sometimes that hard problem question is ignored entirely. Sometimes it's put off until another day. And sometimes it is simply declared answered. But in each case, one is left with the feeling that the central problem remains as puzzling as ever. So the easy problem concerns how we do things given certain stimulation or how we bring things about in the world. And much of the solution to the easy problem can be done, can be, can be arrived at via empirical scientists studying brains, brain functions, patterns of neural activity, etc. But we shouldn't cautions Chalmers, confuse the easy problem, how all of these mechanisms merely go about doing this sort of processing with the hard problem. The hard problem, on the other hand, Chalmers describes like this. Why should there be conscious experience at all? It is central to a subjective viewpoint but from an objective viewpoint, it is utterly unexpected. Taking the objective view, we can tell a story about how fields, waves, and particles in the spatiotemporal manifold interact in subtle ways, leading to the development of complex systems such as brains. In principle, there's no deep philosophical mystery in the fact that these systems can process information in complex ways, react to stimuli with sophisticated behavior, and even exhibit such complex capacities as learning, memory, and language. All of this is impressive, but it's not metaphysically baffling. In contrast, the existence of conscious experience seems to be a new feature from this viewpoint. It's not something that one would have predicted from the other features alone. So notice that all of the elements that Chalmers is talking about in the first part of this quotation, while amazing, are the sorts of things that are encompassed by the easy problem. The hard problem is something over and above that that includes why consciousness should exist at all given these particular physical processes. We can 
make the hard problem of consciousness just a, a little bit easier to understand by putting it into two separate, although related, questions. The first is, why should certain physical processes, but not others, be accompanied by a qualitative conscious state? So, there's a physical process going on inside your computer right now, but your computer isn't conscious. There's a physical process going on in the chair that you're sitting in right now, but your chair isn't conscious. There are physical processes going on in your brain, and you are conscious. Why? Now notice that it won't do just to say, well, they're the physical processes that give rise to consciousness. That's not answering the question. That's saying what we already know, that these physical processes and not other ones give rise to consciousness. What we're looking for is why. And the second component of the hard problem of consciousness is, why should the qualitative conscious states that accompany certain physical processes have the specific qualitative character they in fact have? So, even if we figured out why consciousness arises from certain physical processes, why it follows along with certain physical processes, we wouldn't yet have explained why the particular conscious states have the qualitative character that they do. So why is it that when you bite into an apple, the conscious state that you have is that of biting into an apple rather than the conscious state that you would have when listening to somebody play the piano? Or why does an apple tastes like an apple, and coffee tastes like coffee. Why not switch them the other way around? And again, notice that we couldn't solve this question by just saying, well, the certain chemical reactions that go on in your body are the ones that give rise to this specific taste or this specific sound rather than some other one. What we're asking is why. Why is that? So let's listen to Chalmers briefly explain the hard problem of consciousness to us. So the $64,000 question in the study of consciousness is how can you get some kind of explanation of consciousness wholly in terms of processes in the brain? I mean, in so many other fields, physical explanation has been successful. We've explained chemistry in terms of physics and biology in terms of chemistry and even quite a, quite a few bits of psychology in terms of biology and so on. So it's natural to hope it might work for consciousness too. But there seems to be this big gap in the case of consciousness. No matter how complicated the system of neurons you're looking at and how complex their interactions, it's just very hard to see how this kind of interaction is gonna give you subjective experience. And I actually think this is for systematic reasons. The kinds of explanations you get from looking at a physical system from a third person point of view are great for certain sorts of problems. Um, explaining you know, how, what, what is it systems do, how they behave, you know, so how I walk, how I talk how I use language. That's a, that's a question about what it is that I do. To solve those questions, you just need to find the right mechanism, a mechanism in the brain that brings about that kind of behavior. So some of the problems of consciousness are of that form. You know, how is it that I can point at you? How is it that I can say something in response to a stimulus? But these are what I think of as the easy problems of consciousness. The, the question that really gets us going in the science and the philosophy of consciousness is what I call a hard problem. How is it that all this physical processing in the brain gives you subjective experience. You know, why does it feel like something from the first person point of view? And the trouble is that all of these third person explanations of brain and behavior and so on, no matter how objectively satisfying, always seem to leave this further question open. Why is all that accompanied by subjective experience? And my own view is at least, is that for systematic reasons, any purely neurobiological explanation is never going to answer that question, the hard problem. So we need something else in the explanation. One of the popular views of what consciousness is and how we should explain consciousness has been put forward by philosopher Dan Dennett in terms of a certain position uh, within the field known as physicalism. According to Dennett, in his book Consciousness Explained, there's nothing to be explained about mind over and above the relevant physical interactions. Thus, 
for any actual mental phenomenon, that phenomenon is identical to some physical process. And so once you have explained the physical process, you have explained any relevant mental phenomenon that you thought there was to explain. There is no mental phenomenon over and above the mere physical phenomenon. And in fact, according to Dennett, there is no such thing as consciousness. Consciousness is a mere illusion. All there is are brain processes, and the brain processes themselves shouldn't be talked about in terms of consciousness. They should be talked about in terms of brain processes, information processing, causal interactions, etc. So let's take a listen to Dennett briefly lay out his view. Most people think consciousness, whatever it is, is just supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It's something so wonderful, 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 wonderful that, that we have to sort of divide the universe in two to make room for it, all on one side, all by itself. And I understand why they think that, and I think it's just wrong. It is wonderful. It's astonishingly wonderful, but it is not a miracle, and it isn't magic. It's a bunch of tricks. And uh, it really is. I like the comparison with magic because uh, stage magic, of course, is not magic magic. It's a bunch of tricks. And consciousness is a bunch of tricks in the brain. Uh, and we're learning what those tricks are and how they fit together and why it seems to be so much more than that bunch of tricks. Uh, now, for a lot of people, the very suggestion that that might be so is offensive or repugnant. They really don't like that idea. And uh, they view it as an assault, sort of an assault on their dignity or their specialness. And I think that's a, a, a prime mistake. It's a mistake because it means if you think that way, you're going to systematically ignore the paths of exploration, of research, that, that might tend to confirm that. And you're going to hold out for mystery. You're going to hold out for more specialness than is really there. And some people just can't help themselves. They, 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 they can't take seriously, they won't take seriously, the idea that consciousness is a, an amazing collection of, of sort of mundane tricks in the brain. And they say, oh, I just can't imagine it. And I say, no, you won't imagine it. You can imagine it. You're just not trying. So that's quite a forceful presentation of Dennett's own view. Now, one of the things that I think is unfortunate about the way that Dennett presents his view in his numerous books and articles and lectures, uh, as well as the ways that followers of Dennett's view have presented their own views, is that they seem to think that there are two options and two options only. Either all the mind is is explainable in terms of physical concepts and terms, or there's some sort of special reality, a magical reality or a supernatural reality, and that's where the mind hangs out, and we have to deny science in order to make room for that sort of picture. But, of course, there are many other pictures, and a physicalist doesn't, somebody who thinks that that uh, the physical is very important, um, or maybe even that all things are physical, doesn't need to be a follower of Dennett's particular view. And similarly, somebody who thinks that there's something perhaps over and above the physical that the mind is an exemplar of doesn't need to think that the mind is supernatural or identical with a soul or something like that. So the the debate that goes on in the philosophy of mind is quite a bit more nuanced than uh, it's often presented as being in the popular discussion of these positions. And unfortunately, we've had a number of very embarrassing articles, popular articles written by neuroscientists, cognitive scientists recently, who make claims that are very, that are very similar um, to Dennett's claims, but that seem to fundamentally misunderstand the entire debate that's going on and think that people who deny Dennett's particular view are therefore opting for some sort of magic or supernaturalism. And that's just not true. And so I really do urge you not to fall into the trap of caricaturing uh, the different philosophical positions just because you think that science is 
successful. You'd have to be a fool not to think that science is successful. That doesn't entail Dennett's particular view of physicalism. Now here are some initial problems for Dennett's view of physicalism, and I have to admit that I find these problems to be very convincing. It really does seem as though we have conscious experience. If consciousness is an illusion, as Dennett claims it is, then it has to be an illusion to some consciousness. Illusions are illusions to somebody in terms of how something seems being not the way that it actually is. But if consciousness is an illusion, then consciousness would have to be an illusion to some consciousness. And so we can't escape consciousness here. Now this is something that Chalmers brings up right away, and uh, I have yet to see somebody who accepts Dennett's position appropriately deal with. Further, there's a difference between saying that physical processes give rise to consciousness, that's what Chalmers says, and that an explanation of the physical is thereby an explanation of consciousness. So Chalmers, as you noticed, is not denying that consciousness is intimately related to the physical and is part of the natural world, but that's not to say that physical explanation is a total explanation of the mind. And according to philosopher Thomas Nagel, Consciousness is essentially first personal, and physical phenomena are essentially third personal, and that'll create a serious problem for trying to reduce consciousness to the physical. Now that doesn't mean that consciousness is a different substance or thing or inhabits a different reality, but if there's no way of talking about consciousness except in first personal terms, and there's no way of talking about the physical except in third personal terms, we've got a problem for trying to explain consciousness in terms of the physical. And if we want to try to solve that problem, one of the things that we shouldn't do is just refuse to talk about consciousness in first personal terms. That would seem to negate or ignore the very phenomenon that we're trying to explain. That would be not taking consciousness very seriously at all. Now these problems bring up an important distinction when we're doing the philosophy of mind and especially talking about consciousness. That's the distinction between uh, a couple of big terms, explanatory physicalism and ontological naturalism. Explanatory physicalism is a position about what sorts of explanations are good explanations. Ontological naturalism is a position about the sorts of things that exist, independent of how we explain anything at all. So explanatory physicalism, that's the position that the full explanation of any phenomenon comes in terms of physical concepts. So get all your physical concepts onto the table, your concepts that talk about the physical stuff. If you can explain everything that needs explaining just by using those particular concepts, then explanatory physicalism is true. Ontological naturalism, on the other hand, is the position that the only things that exist in the world are part of the natural world. That is, there are no non-natural or supernatural objects or phenomena. One needn't be an explanatory physicalist in order to be an ontological naturalist. So, for example, Chalmers seems to be some form of ontological naturalist, but Chalmers is claiming that we can't just use physical concepts or explanations in terms of physical concepts when we're trying to deal with the mental. We need to explain in terms that go above and beyond the merely physical. That doesn't mean that something non-physical exists. Now let's turn to just one kind of interesting position that's out there. Um, this is a position known as Mysterianism. More properly, it's called the New Mysterianism to separate it from an old Mysterianism, but um, people just generally call this Mysterianism. This view is uh, most often associated with the philosopher Colin Begin, although there are a number of other philosophers who have held or continue to hold Mysterian positions. And I'm giving you this position not because very many people hold this position, but because it's interesting and I think it's easy to be tempted into this position and um, I think we should probably do whatever we can to avoid this position, but it might be true, it might be inevitable. 
According to McGinn, consciousness is a mystery that human intelligence will never unravel. And the view that the hard problem of consciousness just isn't solvable by humans, that's part of Mysterianism. And Mysterianism might be true for many different reasons. Um, a couple of the reasons why Mysterianism might be true is that maybe our intelligence or our tools are just so limited in principle that we could never use our own intelligence or use our tools in order to fully understand the hard problem of consciousness. Or another reason, maybe since we're all stuck inside consciousness, we can't examine consciousness from within consciousness. So maybe there's a problem of trying to be inside consciousness while also explaining consciousness. Now, I think that Mysterianism is probably not the correct position. I think that there are many good explanatory positions out there that at least give us some hint as to how we might explain the hard problem of consciousness. But this is maybe where we would go to if we couldn't solve the hard problem of consciousness after many, many attempts. Now, there's a position out there in the philosophy of mind known as dualism, and dualism comes in a bunch of different sorts. I'm going to give you just three of the most popular versions of dualism, but you should take care not to think that when someone says that dualism is true or dualism is false, that they're talking about all of the versions of dualism. You can be a dualist in many different senses. One version of dualism is known as substance dualism. It's the position that minds are non-physical substances that exist alongside physical substances. So there are essentially two different sorts of thing in the world, the physical and the non-physical. There are two different types of stuff. This is a position that was hold for, held, for example, by Rene Descartes, and a number of people who might think that you have an immortal soul or an immaterial mind would also hold a dualism of this sort. Property dualism is the position that conscious or mental properties, not substances, but properties, are, along with physical properties, fundamental constituents of reality. And someone is a property dualist if they think that you can't reduce one sort of properties to the other. It's not as though we just have one sort of property under two different names. It's that there are actually two different sorts of properties. This sort of property dualism is what is eventually advocated by Chalmers in his book. And a third sort of dualism is known as liberal naturalism. It's the position that mental facts and physical facts are distinct fundamental constituents of natural reality. This isn't saying that there are two different substances. It's not saying that there are two different sorts of properties. It's saying that there are two different sorts of facts out there in the world at the fundamental level and that neither one is reducible to the other. One of the most prominent proponents of this view, defenders of this view, is my dissertation director, Robert Hanna. And not surprisingly, I hold a view that's similar to his when it comes to the relation between consciousness and the physical, although my, um, my view is um, perhaps a little bit more radical than his view. So in this lecture, we've talked about what's called the hard problem of consciousness, and we've noted that the hard problem is distinguished from what we can call the easy problem of consciousness. The easy problem of consciousness asks how things that are conscious can do things. The hard problem of consciousness asks why there should be consciousness at all arising from physical systems or in relation to physical systems, and even further, why the character of specific conscious states should be that specific character rather than some other one. We've also noted that it's not obvious that mere scientific explanation can tell us everything there is to know about consciousness, and even if it could, we would still have to do some philosophical philosophy of mind work in order to know that all the explanations are physical explanations. And we saw a pretty serious problem when we looked at Dan Dennett's physicalist view in that Dennett is forced to say that consciousness is an illusion, it's not real, although the problem is if consciousness is an illusion, 
It has to be an illusion for some particular consciousness, and then we're right back where we started. I want to urge you when thinking about problems of consciousness not to go to the extremes, not to immediately assume that everything about consciousness is not solvable and that consciousness is magical and mysterious and that um, scientists shouldn't even investigate consciousness, or to just assume that since science has been unbelievably successful in other areas that that means that science must be the sort of thing that can answer every single question there is about consciousness. It does seem as though there is substantial room in the discussion about the nature, character of consciousness for philosophical investigation, and that is precisely what philosophers of mind are up to. Thank you.